speakers um, in the running order in which they're planning to go. Um, we have, first of all, uh, Ruth Lee, who used to be with the Institute of Directors uh, and is now directing Global Vision, which is a think tank doing wonderful work uh, primarily on the European question, and they have an event later on at uh, 5.45, I think, in the, uh, uh, in the main conference area, which I shall be uh, planning to go to. Um, Ruth is extraordinarily well known for, for her extremely sensible views on economic issues, and uh, we see her constantly in the paper and frequently in the broadcast media, um, so I can get away with that famous chairman's line, she needs no further introduction. <laughs> um, following Ruth, um, we have Caroline Boin, and I spent a long time practicing that pronunciation. I think I am right. Um, the name is French, and my French pronunciation is not that good. Um, uh, Caroline works with the International Policy Network, uh, and I have heard her speak uh, at a couple of events, and I believe she's also done a fair bit of broadcast work, the odd appearance on Question Time and so on. I've been hugely impressed. She takes no prisoners, um, and she doesn't suffer fools gladly. Um, and I'm looking forward very much to hearing what she has to say. Uh, and then thirdly, to address particularly the science of the issue, um, we're extremely privileged to have Christopher Monkton, Viscount Monkton, um, who has done also a great deal of work on this issue. He has written extremely learned and informed articles in the press. Uh, he has addressed many, many different meetings on the subject, including one, I believe, at Oxford University, which was recorded in the form of a DVD, and I'll be very honest with you, it's probably a lot better than my DVD, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and we have copies of that available too, as well as copies, uh, I may say, of the, uh, of the famous Channel 4 film, The Great Global Warming Swindle. Um, I'll just tell you briefly a story about The Great Global Warming Swindle. We showed it right at the end of my first four-day conference on climate issues in the European Parliament. And there were a lot of young people, assistants in the parliament, who were watching that program. And I heard them saying on the way out, we didn't know there was an alternative view. We just thought it was happening. Everybody tells us it's happening. Um, so I do recommend that as well. So as I say, we have a, a, we have a wonderful panel here. I'm extremely grateful uh, to our panelists for coming. Somebody may think of asking the question, well, aren't we going to have a debate? Uh, and where are those climate alarmists who will propose the conventional view? And the answer is, if you want to hear the conventional view, just turn on the BBC. Yeah. <laughs> um, and with that, I will invite Ruth to address us first of all. Thank you very much, Ruth. Well, I'm absolutely delighted to be here because uh, this is a subject very close to my heart. And I must say, with Roger's opening remarks, I think you pretty well said what I'm going to tell you now. Yep. And as I'm noted, I do not have a DVD, alas, the best had to make do with me. But I am delighted to be here because I do think, as, as Roger has said, that uh, the whole climate change debate is extremely vital. We're in the middle of a financial crisis at the moment, something that I think has taken even city watchers such as myself somewhat unawares. I think we're going to end up with a similar energy crisis in three or four years' time, and people will say, well, why didn't somebody warn us? Well, there are some of us who are trying to make that warning. But I think what I would like to concentrate on now is to look at British climate change policies and some of the economic consequences. Suffice to say, this is a, a long and convoluted subject, so I'll just stick to the main issues. As you probably know, there's something called the Climate Change Bill that has been going through Parliament, and it is due to get the Royal Assent pretty soon. And it has two incredible targets for, quotes decarbonising our economy. We're meant to be getting, cutting our carbon dioxide emissions by 60% by the year 2050, and we're meant to be cutting our carbon dioxide emissions by 2020 by 26 to 32%. That is even more self-flagellating than the European Union's carbon dioxide cutting targets of 20% by 2020. And without what we think to sort of forego my conclusion, I must say that I think it's entirely unrealistic and potentially extremely expensive. But of course, the whole idea behind these, these, these uh, decarbonizing uh, the ideas is that as we lead, then other countries will follow, rather like the Pied Piper of Hamlin we will show the other countries the way forward. They say, if we're the exemplar, we decarbonize our economy, we combat climate change that way, then all the other countries will follow. 
I don't think they will. But I think before going on to uh, looking at uh, the economic consequences of our climate change policies, I can't resist the idea of just making a comment generally on climate change. And I'm uh, not a historian, I'm not a geologist, I'm none of those things, but I have a certain curiosity about the world. And I understand that the last ice age only finished about 10,000 years ago. And then there was a huge warming of the planet that about 5,000 years ago in the Holocene maximum, in fact, temperatures were warmer than they are today. And it was known, actually, as the Holocene optimum. The idea being in those Neolithic balmy times, that was a nice optimal temperature. And indeed, temperatures then could have been one and a half degrees centigrade than they're higher to, than they are today. And it was true that uh, Neolithic farmers managed to cope and adapt with the changes in temperature really rather well. And then, of course, you went through a period of calling it the archaic cooling period, when things cooled down, as indeed the name suggests, but then in Roman times, things were warmed up, which I uh, must admit, I, when I first went up Hadrian's Wall, I thought how uncomfortable it must have been for the Roman soldiers to be wearing short skirts in, in a North, North Humbrian winter, but if it was a, a nice warm period, perhaps it wasn't that bad at all. <coughs> then there was a cooler period, the Dark Ages, and then in the high medieval and the late medieval times, there was yet another period of warning. And that coincided, of course, with the great, great flowering of medieval culture. But by 1500, the earth was beginning to cool again. We went into the Little Ice Age, and I always think that Greenland's icy mountains got that much icier, and indeed the Norse settlements did actually die out. And then about the middle of the 19th century, I nearly said the last century, but I do realize we're now in the 21st century, but in the middle of the 19th century, of course, things began to warm up again. There were fluctuations around the trend. And indeed, even in the 1960s and 70s, there was a period of cooling again. I remember the winter of 1962, 63, and my God, it cold. I think that's what I actually brought one afar when all the pipes froze up, but that's another story. But my, it was cold. And even in the 70s, we kept hearing about how we were heading for a new ice age. Do you remember that? Yes. And you read Time magazine and all those other magazines. And they had, the, had these terrible apocalyptic pictures of us sitting there in, with, with polar bears all around us, rather like Lancia, because this was going to the new ice age. And then, hey presto, in the 1990s, things warmed up a little bit. And now, of course, since the late, late 90, 1990s, as I understand it, temperatures have not risen at all. If anything, they're now slightly cooling. <laughs> but I think that the message of all this is that climate change is there always with us. And the idea that it is unquestionably a function of man-made carbon dioxide emissions always struck me as a trifle suspect. But of course, it is behind all of the British government's uh, climate policies. And there's a second thing, of course, which is behind British government policy. And that is, you have a sort of a, a unicausal a, a reason for climate change. There's a very simple way in which you can combat climate change, in which you can mitigate it, in which you can control climate change. And that is that if you actually cut back on carbon dioxide emissions, you can therefore cut back on the temperature increase. Now, I am not a climate scientist, I don't pretend to be, but I do make sure that I have friends who are. And my friends who are climate scientists tell me that this is just ridiculous. The idea that one variable just triggers the policy data, so I just managed to spill my water. Uh, the, the, the idea that one variable just manages to trigger off these great changes in climate change and, and control climate change is just absurd. In fact, if anything, by cutting back on man-made climate change, you could actually warm the planet up. In other words, the whole idea behind mitigation has got very little scientific, fun, scientific fun reasoning behind it. And I think the, the next thing I would say, as I sort of come away through the water that I managed to spill, <laughs> 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 um, it's a... Tsunami. Oh dear, I've really made a terrible mess here. Clearly, as I was saying right at the beginning of my comment, the, the sort of the third leg to our uh, climate change policy is that if we cut back on our carbon dioxide emissions, if we are good children, then all the other countries will follow. Frankly, no. Uh, China will not follow what we're doing. 